Hello, you're watching Roundtable. As Russia's president sits in the Kremlin raging about Ukraine, his nuclear forces on high alert, Russians have taken to the streets to protest about Putin's war, a war that is meeting heavy resistance on the streets of Kiev. Will the body bags and sanctions lead to a coup in Moscow? Very good to have your company. I'm David Foster. Vladimir Putin's war in Ukraine would appear not to be going to plan. Rather than splitting NATO and the European Union, he has given both of them renewed purpose. Germany has ditched pacifism and, in a historic move, committed to spending billions on its defence. And after embarrassingly sending only 5,000 actual helmets before the war, is now preparing to send anti-tank weaponry. The president remains in the capital. The government is fully functional. The army keeps on fighting in all three directions. People continue to be determined to fight back. And this is also the message to our friends and our partners here in Germany. Damn it, it's finally time to help us with what we need. We need air defense and we need a no-fly zone. Even the Chinese are becoming less supportive of Vladimir Putin, with reports suggesting that Beijing has said it won't lend to any Chinese firms that want to buy Russian oil or gas. And with crippling sanctions, Putin's diligent efforts to shield the economy with hundreds of billions of dollars squirreled away has amounted so far to a mirage. Well, there you can see our two guests at the very top in Rome. We See Alisa Muzeg, Senior Research Fellow at Euro Creative Think Tank. And in London, Domitila Sagramoso, Lecturer in Security and Development at King's College. Um, Alisa, I'll come to you in just a moment because you've been trying to put with your think tank ideas together for where Ukraine should go, both before the conflict and presumably after the conflict. Now you've been thinking about it for a long time, but this is Focused Minds. I'll come to you in just a moment to get the personal view on this. But Domitila, I want to ask you this question. I know that you've studied conflict very seriously for a number of years. Looking at what the Russian forces have done, looking at what's happened from the Kremlin, is there anything here, and we can discount the moral side of this, but is there anything here that Vladimir Putin and his forces have got right? Uh, it's, it's a very difficult question because there's so many things they got wrong. So... Um... I can explain a bit what they, they didn't get right and, uh, and then we can maybe assess what could eventually uh, turn out to be right for them. I would love you to do uh, that. We've got plenty of time. Uh, I think it is clear that they were expecting a much um, sort of weaker resistance from the Ukrainian armed forces, from the Ukrainian population at large. Uh, they were hoping that they were going to be received um, maybe uh, in a welcoming fashion, especially in the eastern parts of Ukraine. Uh, I think that they uh, didn't, didn't organize properly their, their initial advances. Uh, there were a lot of problems with supplies. Uh, there is apparently also uh, problems with morale. Uh, they didn't really manage in the initial uh, days to um, control the Ukrainian airspace. Uh, they sent in paratroopers uh, that were not properly protected from the air with helicopter cover or other kind of air cover support. So they, they suffered many, many losses. Uh, and uh, they really underestimated, above all, the sort of the strong resilience, not only of the Ukrainian leadership, but also of his team. And, and more importantly, also for them, of the entire sort of a Western community of nations uh, in Europe uh, and also globally. Many countries have condemned these operations. Uh, the West has imposed uh, significant sanctions, and we may have to talk about that as well. So all this has, has been uh, a significant setback for uh, the Kremlin. However, um, it seems as though now they are slowly but steadily advancing from the south also from the north, what they did get right was to get the support and alliance of uh, Belarus, uh, of the Belarusian leadership, because it's of course not representative of the people of Belarus. 
Um, so uh, I think that uh, in that respect, they have uh, the capacity to, uh, in, in, in a way, to be able to enter uh, Kiev from both sides, from the east and from the west, uh, northwards. Uh, and, and also now they've managed apparently to, to almost uh, sort of uh, ensure that Kiev is, is almost circled, it's very hard to get out. Uh, and that uh, creates problems uh, for um, uh, the armed forces that are trying to be um, supplied and also the people who are inside. Uh, so there, are, there are, this is a very critical moment, uh, but uh, the Ukrainians uh, have managed so far to, to resist uh, quite heroically. Another thing the Russians are doing, as we know, is bombing uh, cities, and that really doesn't play in their favor. Okay, I will come back and ask you in just a moment why you think the Kremlin got it as wrong as it did that long list of mistakes uh, made by the military and political leaders of Russia. Um, but, uh, Elisa, I want to come to you first of all. D Domitila referenced there the resistance. Um, have you been surprised, as she suggests the Kremlin may have been surprised, by the level of resistance from the Ukrainian people? Uh, I personally haven't been surprised because I'm originally coming from Ukraine, actually from the east of Ukraine, from the city of Kharkiv. But I've been studying and working uh, in, the, in the European Union for many years, but obviously having family, having friends, and having been myself very active also during the events of Euromaidan. I know very well uh, the spirit and the moods of, of Ukrainians, and I know how they can unite in, in tough uh, crisis times. And it's exactly what we're witnessing now because the whole society is united. And that's putting something I feel like didn't understand or miscalculated because he probably saw that he launched a war against the uh, Ukrainian army and maybe he expected that uh, civilian population would welcome them. But it is completely wrong, obviously, and we can see that even in the East, uh, because people very know, very well know what the face of uh, Russian world, the so-called Ruski Mir, is, and they don't want to have it in Ukraine. And there are so many heroic stories all around Ukraine uh, where you can see people with bare foot trying, <laughs> bare hands trying to. Uh, stop tanks, uh, where they united uh, by, by in the protest uh, and just with uh, uh, flags of Ukraine gathering on the square and shouting basically at the Russian soldiers and make them uh, step aside. So on my side, um, I'm not I'm not surprised. Is but there a split? I'm always amazed. Is there a split within Ukraine? Whereas those who are older and can remember living under a Soviet rule, may hanker back to some of those things, the certainty that uh, that form of communism gave them, the, the protection they may have felt from Western aggression. I'm not saying it's right, but those things they may have felt. Whereas the younger generation who've only known freedom are those that are actually sort of saying, you can't take this away from us. Or, or is society in Ukraine, in your opinion, one at one with the, uh, the resistance? You know, there are some kind of jokes in Ukraine that Putin is actually the one who managed to unite Ukrainian nation. And this is kind of true because, you know, in 2014, we've seen this split. We've seen the split in the east and west of Ukraine. We've seen a split of generation. But it's not the case anymore. Nobody wants to live under bombs. Nobody wants to spend their nights in, in the shelters. And uh, I think for older generation, when they see this military aggression these days, they more rely, relate not to uh, Soviet Union, but rather to the events of the Second World War. Obviously, they personally not remember them, but they remember the stories of their parents, for example. And uh, when they see and hear the situation in Kiev, and they hear this bomb alerts all the time, I think it's exactly the thoughts everybody is having. Uh, Domitile, let me ask you about another, perhaps, miscalculation made by Putin. And as that is perhaps that he would have had countries on his side. Um, friends at the moment, or certainly not enemies at the moment, China, um, India, uh, Pakistan, he may have expected to get their support. Was that a miscalculation? And where does it leave him now that they're sort of lukewarm? Well, I mean... 
the fact that they are in some way uh, not co completely sort of condemning the actions of Russia uh, is from the perspective of Moscow uh, maybe positive. Uh, the Chinese, of course, have not blocked uh, the Security Council resolutions and they have allowed uh, the discussion of the of the um, uh, invasion of Ukraine by Russia in the U U UN General Assembly. Uh, but uh, and at the same time, the Chinese uh, have insisted on uh, the respect of Ukraine's territorial integrity, but they have not imposed sanctions. Uh, they have decided to continue trading with Russia, but they have apparently also stated that they are not going to finance for example, Russian uh, Russian uh, energy energy sector. So uh, the support of China has been very important uh, initially. What I'm suggesting, sorry to butt in, and what I'm suggesting is that they haven't actually given their support. They have basically stood on the sidelines. They've sat on the fence and said, well, you know, we, we need to still do a bit of business with Russia. On the other hand, we're not going to support Russia in, in this, partly for its own self-interest, that is China's own self-interest, because it, it doesn't want to be seen to be playing any particular um, geographical, political cards at this at this moment. That that must be a blow to Russia. I would have thought. And well, it is and it isn't because I hear what what we then want to discuss is whether China can be a, a supporter to the you know to the Russian economy, and that is what really counts. Uh, and if they continue trading and if they continue buying natural resources from Russia, as are, by the way, the Pakistanis. They just signed an agreement on the purchase of energy resources, and also, I think it was wheat, if I'm not mistaken. So um, there are countries that are in some way, uh, I'm not saying helping Russia, but not making life harder to Russia. Uh, I think that uh, it is relevant in a way that they are not fully aligning themselves with Russia. Uh, and that may be some a, a disappointment from the Russian perspective, because we see really generally sort of global condemnation. And it seems that um, Putin is very worried about this. There were reports that were coming from U.S. intelligence services uh, yesterday that were saying that Putin was very frustrated because of the lack of success uh, of their military operation in the way that he had expected, and also because uh, he seemed that the country was being increasingly isolated. So you're absolutely right. I mean, there isn't a, a, a complete uh, sort of alignment and support from these countries, but unfortunately these countries can be uh, can become lifelines for Russia, and, and, and that can allow Russia to uh, sort of muddle through, uh, as to well, say. Well, um, there's also the counter-argument that they might like to see a slightly weakened Russia, because um, it could be to, to their benefit. Um, Alisa, let me... I'll come back to you, Domitilla, in just a moment. Um, Alisa, let me ask you, you've, you've presumably spoken to friends you have um, in one of the major urban centres. Have you spoken to family that may be out there? Um, a... Are they surprised at the international condemnation of Russia, the support for Ukraine? Are they surprised, perhaps, that he appears to have got it wrong? Um, I'm in constant touch, obviously, because my close family, my friends are all around the country. And in particular, the city of Kharkiv, as I mentioned, which has been shelled this morning, uh, and there are a lot of civilian losses. Um, People are obviously expecting a strong support of the West. I would say that there was quite a strong frustration by a weak reaction of the Western community after the events of 2014, when Russia annexed uh, Crimea, when Russia instigated the war in Donbass. But this time we see a complete different mood, especially in Europe. Uh, I, I must confess I'm personally surprised because I've been working on... Uh, FARs related to EU common and foreign common foreign security policy in Europe. And uh, just yesterday or last week, we've been talking about things and it's thought that it would be impossible. And what we see now, like complete shift, for example, in the in the German um, policy, in the foreign policy, uh, their commitment to 2% of, of uh, NATO, uh, Switzerland, which abandoned its neutrality and joined EU sanctions, uh, Finland, which is discussing joining of NATO uh, with uh, a strong support among the population. So it's been like a change of mood, so I must well, you see, this say, is, this is, this is where This is where I'm driving, because 
Um, if you go back to 2014, when the response um, of the West to the invasion and annexation of Crimea, to, to what happened um, in, in the Donbass region, was so lukewarm, um, it surprised me that the West was so, A, eventually, or pretty quickly, united, and secondly, was prepared to take much more drastic action. Why do you think the situations are regarded differently by political leaders in 2022 as opposed to 2014? Because I think everybody understands that we are witnessing a total collapse of the whole uh, post-Second World War liberal order of all the uh, global institutions, uh, values which we've been building, and Russia just uh, doesn't care about that. And they blatantly attacked uh, Ukraine, even without any pretext. I remember when uh, experts were discussing what kind of uh, false flag attack uh, Russia would do or what kind of pretext they would use. And in, in fact, they didn't even need that. They just established uh, or they started this blatant attack on Ukraine, uh, aggression, and everybody understood that Putin is probably not in the very healthy uh, or sane uh, state ah, of mind. This is where and this is where I'm driving. Not only Ukraine. This is where I'm driving, Domitilla. I'm wondering what is different about um, the times in which we live, 2014, 2022, um, because what he did in Crimea was invasive, sent forces in, annexed the region, went did the same in the Donbass region. Why is this regarded as something entirely different? Is it because they think he's um, if not lost his marble table, uh, he may have lost his marbles. There are two aspects that are important. First of all, there's a much higher number of casualties. I mean, this is a full invasion and uh, um, the annexation of Crimea, which was illegal under international law, and it's a territory that belongs to Ukraine, was annexed by Russia without uh, much violence. So unfortunately, the narrative developed that somehow this was a territory that had always belonged to Russia and Russia had some kind of special right to reobtain it again, which it did with, uh, you know, the threat of force. Uh, when we think about the Donbass, uh, the perception was that this was uh, a, a, a violence that was taking place in, 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 in the eastern parts of Ukraine, which is already in the eastern fringes of Europe. So Europeans felt that this was very far away and it didn't really affect them. Uh, and, and there was also some sense of sympathy uh, towards uh, those who maybe felt that they had stronger allegiances to, to Russia. And, and a lot of the narrative that came from the Kremlin was unfortunately um, believed. So it's nothing to, do, uh, now, nothing to do with the fact that perhaps now um, the world is recognising that President Putin isn't quite the, the rational autocrat that he might have been back in 2014. It's nothing to do with the fact that they're not thinking that he's more dangerous now. It's just that it's more on their doorstep. Both. I think they're very worried because uh, Putin is seen as much more irrational, uh, although there can be a rationality built behind uh, his actions. Uh, and, and there is a scare that we don't know if this is going to escalate to the level of a nuclear confrontation. And uh, second, because if Putin uh, advances, and there is not only the danger that was pointed out by the other speaker, that we challenge really the international order, uh, the liberal international order, which is based on the rule of law and the non-threat and use of force against other states, but also that Putin can come much closer to the borders of the European Union and of NATO. And this is now perceived as a direct threat, and people are really scared and worried. So I think that this whole gamble by Putin, uh, you know, backfired in many, many ways. Uh, they could still take Ukraine, they could still install some form of uh, pro-Russian regime, but I think in the long term it's not going to succeed. I'll come back and ask you in a moment, Domitilla, whether things would have been different under President Trump, and you can say in what way they might have been different. But I want to come... Uh, first of all, I, before I come to you, Elisa, I'm going to play this uh, clip from Joseph Borrell, the uh, head of foreign affairs, if you like, at the European Union. Ukraine has clearly, has clearly an European perspective, but now we have to fight against an aggression. And um, the world cannot afford that the powerful country smashes the neighbor using its military capacities. If we allow to it, it's the law of the jungle. It's the law of the stronger. I am stronger than you, and I kill you. I impose you my, my law. It's the law of the jungle, and this, for us Europeans, is an existential threat. 
and we'll do everything we can in order to stop it. Alisa, he refers to it being a thread about the very existence of, of, of Europe as a social concept, not necessarily geographically. Um, do you, as a Ukrainian, living and working in Rome, feel like a European? Do many of your country, men and women, feel as though they are actually part of Europe? Yeah. I'm he, glad to hear these words from uh, Joseph Borrell. Uh, he also today announced that this is a moment for the geopolitical Europe. And I'm, I'm very happy to hear that because it's something what we've been expecting, because we as Ukrainians have been talking about this existential threat from Russia for so many years. And unfortunately, our friends and colleagues in the West very often just couldn't understand us because also, as you mentioned before, they saw Crimea, they saw Donbass as some kind of minor regional issue, and they didn't understand the whole narrative of Putin, of uh, reuniting uh, Russian empire, so-called. Also, let's not forget Belarus, because uh, at the moment it's uh, uh, actually occupied by, by the Russian forces. And uh, even more, Belarus also joined today the, the Russian invasion of Ukraine with uh, Belarusian soldiers being on, on Ukrainian ground. So as for my feeling, my identity, if you ask me how I feel, my first uh, answer would be a European. It's a totally how I feel. Because, for example, in Italy, we have a very big major majority of Ukrainians. And um, if you could see the protests are happening every day, there are a lot of both Ukrainians and Italians gathering together. At this moment, they are collecting the humanitarian aid all over Italy, and uh, they're looking for bulletproof vests for Ukrainian territorial self-defense. They are donating lots of lots of things to Ukraine, and it's happening in common efforts. It's not only that Ukrainians do it separately, and we are feeling this very strong support, not only in Italy, but in all other countries of Europe, and actually all around the world at this moment. Uh, Domitila... Um, the British Defence Minister said that he thought that President Putin had gone full tonto. Um, for those that don't understand the expression, it means completely mad. Uh, but I wonder if he would have been inclined to do such a thing had one Donald Trump been in office in the United States. Do you think he's recognised a weakness in the West, which is now, unfortunately for him, um, proving perhaps to be his downfall, which he would not have dared to do had there been somebody perhaps equally, um, I'll say, irrational um, in the White House? No, I'm of the opposite view. I think if Donald Trump was here, we would be, the response would have been a lot more, more uh, sort of uh, uh, less well organized or less cohesive from the West. So when Donald Trump was in power, the, the, the West and the Euro Atlantic Alliance was much more dysfunctional and much weaker because of his position and also because uh, he didn't really care about what was happening in Ukraine. I mean, he didn't put a lot of pressure, as we know, on on uh, President Zelensky to get um, a, a negative information about uh, candidate uh, Joe Biden during the elections and, and challenge or threaten not to deliver uh, military aid. So I think that, um, um, I mean, if, if in a way, I mean, we should be happy that, uh, you know, we have President Biden, because if Russia had decided to carry out this operation uh, under President Trump, I mean, our response would have been not so determined, not so united, not so coherent. I want to ask you this. I'll come back to you, Alisa, in just a moment to wrap the programme up. But one thing that we haven't heard very much about, Domitella, is, is the Black Sea. Um, and any kind of naval confrontation in there, because, of course, it has so many borders around it. It is such an important um, means of transit um, from the Mediterranean through to Russia, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. If we start to see any kind of conflict in the Black Sea, is, is that likely to, to make things a great deal worse? Well, I mean, Turkey uh, over the weekend uh, decided to close uh, the, the straits to Russian warships that would, would want to come from through the Mediterranean. So that's a very important move. And that uh, potentially could lead to further escalation if Russia uh, decides to challenge that. At the moment, I have not heard any responses to that. Uh, also, what was very dangerous was that I, I think in the first days of the war, uh, some uh, non-Ukrainian uh, ships were hit, I think a Moldovan vessel, uh, and I can't remember the, the nationality of the other vessel. So that is also very dangerous, the fact that there could be sort of accidental attacks on vessels that are 
commercial vessels. Uh, so certainly the, the, the operation of Russia in that area is extremely dangerous. Domitilla, thank you very much indeed. I did say, um, Alisa, that we'd give you the last word. Unfortunately, uh, we've run out of time. But come back to us on another occasion. We'd be delighted to hear your thoughts. Um, unfortunately, I think this is going to go on for um, weeks, if not months. Um, let's hope it's not years. Thank you very much indeed, Alisa. And also to you, Domitilla, thank you for coming back to the programme. Very good to have your company. Uh, likewise, with those of you who've watched this, uh, we're trying here on Roundtable to give some context, some background to why events may happen the way that they, they do, to try and understand the rationale, if there is any kind of uh, logic to this, and where it might take you in the future, rather than simply those news moments, those terrible news moments that happen in a dreadful conflict like this on a day-by-day, hour-by-hour basis. We give you the background. More of us around table. Thanks for watching. Bye bye.